All right, so Bronwyn is going to talk about, um, our last speaker who's been waiting patiently is Bronwyn Voice, who's going to talk about 2030 blueprint for a national circular economy infrastructure strategy. Bronwyn is the founder of Civic Futures Lab, an impact lab for government, ASX, and SME leaders seeking to address climate risk and accelerate the global transition to a circular economy. She's also chair of Circular Economy, Circular Australia's Industry Task Force and is deeply passionate about supporting the private sector to lead the national transition to circularity and a low carbon economy. Welcome, Bronwyn. Right, good morning. I am between you and your next coffee. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners and building on uh, what Tony said, I think, the reason I think this is really important uh, for all of us is to be thinking about is we are all stewards um, of this beautiful land that we all live on um, and for this borrowed time that we're here and we need to be thinking about what we're leaving for the next generation. So I actually think that this is a really part of the important part of the conversation when we think about circular economy. Uh, thanks very much, Gail, for the intro. I'll skip past that. So, Australia has a target to develop a circular economy by 2030. What that actually means right now is currently TBD by the uh, ministerial advisory group that has just, by the way, been announced uh, some further funding yesterday, 23 million, to establish our national framework. Um, we do have a target, though, to reduce emissions by 43%. And... By 2030, that's, by my calculations, 2,000-odd days away until January 1. So the, the hard facts, we currently emit 4 million, uh, 465 million tonnes of carbon. We need to reduce those emissions by 43%. And our 2030 point target is 354 million tonnes of carbon emissions. Most of those emissions are anticipated to come from energy uh, reduction by tw between 2030 and 20, uh, 2020 and 2030. Uh, so what do we do beyond that? What do we do once we've got solar panels, once we've got electric vehicles, once we've got more hydrogen garbage trucks as we see out in the lot there? Well, the thing is, material use is actually the single largest uh, determinant of that energy use. And so we need to be thinking about that now, as well as beyond the 2030 mark. The rising material extraction, the consumption that Gail keeps talking on about, uh, uh, talking about, is driving circularity down. In fact, 9.1% globally in 2018 to 86 and now 7.2% in the most recent Global Circularity Gap report. And Australia's circularity rate is much less than that, 3.5% in 2015. Uh, it's improved slightly to 4%, but we're half of the global average. But we know that we're investing in uh, circular supportive infrastructure. In fact, this is a lovely, and by the way, thanks for the great data dashboard. Um, I'll talk a bit more about data in this presentation. Uh, the, you know, we've invested almost a almost billion dollars in recycling infrastructure. Uh, so we, we've got this on the agenda, we've got this in the national landscape, and a lot of that investment is coming from industry. But we've got some red flags. We've still got 40% of our end-of-life materials, or if you want to call it waste, going to landfill. Uh, we know that Australia has a high material footprint, and we know that um, we've only got five years left to really achieve that 80% resource recovery rate. So I think a lot of the speakers have kind of brought together the story that I'm going to be sort of trying to bring to what do we actually do next. We also know that Australia has $237 billion pipeline of infrastructure that we're going to build, whether it's roads, public infrastructure, hospitals, schools, over the next five years. And based on roads alone, we could, with the current technology, we could substitute conventional materials, 54 million tonnes of it, with recycled content today. But we're not reaching those targets. Again, Procurement policies are coming into place, and I've mentioned on the left-hand side the, ref the red flags there that we don't, and again, the speakers have reiterated this, so I'm, try, I'm going to skip over some of these points, also because we are, I am between you and the next uh, the coffee. Um, but we don't have those effective disincentives to uh, 
make the market. We don't have the eco-design standards, the uh, ERPs that are mandatory, we've got voluntary ones. And then the government's brought up recently that they have new procurement policy that construction services uh, for projects over seven and a half million must meet climate, environmental and circularity outcomes. We've also had the announcement of the $15 billion National Reconstruction Fund to transform industry and economy. So on one side, we've got some significant challenges, but we're starting to see some green flags on the other side. But going back to that figure, we've just invested almost a billion dollars in recycling infrastructure the majority of that come from industry, and yet that's only added 1.28 million tonnes of additional capacity to the market. So with 2,000 days to go, and what we've achieved in the last 2,000 days, what are we going to be doing differently? Australia could double its circularity rate if we realise circular opportunity opportunities in housing, mobility, food and energy. And circularity could also save Australia 165 million tonnes of carbon per year by 2040. And we know that this is going to be more critical, critical for companies as they have exhausted all other options to reduce their emissions and are seeking to modify and improve their supply chains. And the, and the, the people in the room are really the ones that are going to be influencing what that looks like. And apologies for the little typo on the double 75% of the slide. But we know that around 75% of the G20 countries have circular economy policies. Joanne uh, spoke about the Netherlands, who I've had the opportunity to work with. Uh, Australia does not, and it doesn't. And although they're working on it, we've still got a long way off between before when that national framework is established and when the federal policies regulations come into play, because we know it takes time. In the meantime, the states are working on their relative policies and their strategies. And Tony talked about some of that before in terms of the New South Wales, and I would like to challenge that it's changed from the waste infrastructure strategy, Tony, to the circular economy infrastructure strategy when that does come out. Um, but we do have a lot of work happening in various states and territories to establish state-based circular economy strategies and policies. The thing is, in Australia, is we're a small population over a large space, and we all know that. We're half the size of California in terms of population, and in terms of land mass, we're almost the same size as the US. So to a point that Gail made recently, what are we doing as Team Australia? It's great that individually states are taking leadership, but we can't afford to be uber competitive at a state level uh, and at the risk of having more inconsistencies, uh, what we continue to hear from industry is we want a consistent approach across states because we're simply not big enough at scale to be doing 10 different things in 10 different jurisdictions. And then that goes down to local policies as well. So what we do know is that we have sufficient amount of waste and resource recovery data, research and insights and round tables and task force that are doing more studies. <laughs> we have a lot of data. This, by the way, is a fantastic data set that will tell you, if you go in the top corner there, where all the plastic recycling facilities are nationally, where all the rubber recycling facilities are, where some of the reuse hubs are. So we know that we have a bunch of infrastructure scattered across our diverse communities in all corners of states and territories. We know that. And Anne presented some really great data as well. So we've got the data. But we do have this diverse geography. We're not the Netherlands. We're not a tiny little pocket that can sort of solve problems the same way. And while the European models can be applied to, say, metropolitan areas in Australia, remote and regional areas really lack that scale and present the logistical challenges. We all know that. So we understand the supply. We understand the materials coming in. We've got import data. We've got waste material flow data. We've got waste data coming out the other side. But we need to influence those flows differently. We need to invest more in that demand side, which we constantly hear from industry, who are having to deal with materials at end of life. Um, and we need a more strategic approach to infrastructure planning. 
So we need to stop investing in these single infrastructure projects, and again, to the, the point of John and the previous, and think about where there's that tension and the explosion, how we are collaborating across value chains. We need to start thinking about how we are investing in systems. So I do think there are good and exciting things ahead of us, um, but what do we need to do to move forward? Well, I'm going to talk about two main things now. Uh, and again, a, a number of the speakers have covered a, a lot of these topics. I'm hoping it brings together some of those ideas. Being mindful of the people in the room of where I focus my, uh, my points of discussion. We're not all at the design and um, the beginning of life phase. A lot of us are kind of at that end of life phase or as local government or policy makers in various states um, thinking about how we work with waste resource recovery industry to reshape the sector. So again, progress over perfection. Uh, New South Wales have provided a circular design guideline for the built environment. The guidelines are there. What we need to do at local, state and regional levels are start to adopt these policies, these procedures and test, try, experiment. And we need to think about it across the, the whole of life stage of um, assets. So for my sins, I've worked in and around local government for long enough, I've been a local councillor, I've had engineers sitting around the table talk about whole of life, asset management, till the cows come home. Um, we're not talking enough about how we're thinking about design uh, of that public infrastructure with circular principles in mind. And when we do do that, we say, okay, let's put a recycled content target, um, or perhaps where they have done adopt these models, model um, guidelines. We're not thinking about how we drive that value chain collaboration to get that systemic change that we need. And so that can actually be built into our procurement. Specify that you need to collaborate within local value chains or regional value chains to deliver the solution. This is not my uh, diagram, but when we talk about infrastructure and we talk about investing in that $237 million uh, five-year infrastructure pipeline, we've got to be thinking about infrastructure differently. How are we replacing, reusing, uh, and reducing material consumptions that are from virgin materials and not from renewable sources, and how are we using local systems to generate that demand? We know that, again, from the data that's been shown by Anne as well, that we have some uh, organic, which is uh, the, the green up there. We know that the uh, cement and the use of, uh, oh, and sorry, and the disposal of those is still not currently meeting the targets. But what we also know is that those provide the greatest abatement options. And this is a report from um, a cost curve analysis uh, that, again, New South Wales government funded. So we, know, we have the data. We know what, where we will get the biggest bang for our buck, both in emissions and in materials. So let's think about if we identified, we looked at that $237 million pipeline, and we know what we're going to be building in local government, in regions. We know what materials we're going to be needing. So let's think about how we work across locals and state uh, and regions to ensure that the supply of those materials are coming from these renewed, renewable, recycled sources. And then the second lead part that I want to talk about is really about re rethinking that enabling infrastructure. And I really think that the, the plan that New South Wales is working on, uh, well, I'm hoping that this will align with, with a lot of this, uh, but the more collaborative land use planning and exploring hub and spoke models of service delivery should allow enough waste resource recovery service to offer communities this essential service regardless of their geographic location as quoted by Infrastructure Australia in 2021. As I said, I've been around uh, land use planning long enough. I've also been around uh, essential service delivery uh, planning and implementation. And the way we think, if you think about um, health services, we design our health system and we build hospitals and the uh, associated services, whether it's a pathology or a local doctor or a visiting doctor, in this hub and spoke model. And it's based on what we know the demand is, what we know the population is, what we know. We've got data that informs that design and development of that infrastructure to support that service. Why don't we do that in waste and resource recovery in a way that starts to think about circularity, the reuse, the 
repair, as well as those geographical and scale issues that we all know that we, we face in regions and, and rural Australia. BAU is the enemy of sustainability and circular economy. For circular economy to happen, we need this enabling infrastructure that must be planned and invested in differently. The single facility scattergun approach that we've done to like, oh, somebody in the outback has a great idea about how to deal with that material and let's, let's chuck some money at that there. Sure, it's solving a problem. Is it the most important problem to be solved? Does it deliver the greater benefits? And will it enable this broader uh, supply and demand to be met? We need a bipartisan approach on this national strategy so when the feds and states subsequently invest taxpayers' money, uh, which is supported by private sector investment as well, that it is evidence-based and it is based on the materials demand. And we need to adopt a precinct approach and actively facilitate industrial symbiosis, which again has been tried, tested and experimented with in the Netherlands and we've got plenty to learn from. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. So connecting more hubs and spokes. In economic development, which is my background, we have a great understanding of that cluster-based local economic development approach. We need to apply that with the lens of circularity. It's not different to what we've done before. We know that there's existing manufacturing hubs, um, eco-precincts, and when we think about where the material flows between those and how we can invest in the infrastructure to support greater material flows, it starts to change the conversation. So that place-based approach is really critical. The centralised and decentralised hubs and spokes are what we need to be thinking about when we're investing in circular economy enabling infrastructure. And they need to be specialised and we need to think about where the real strengths are, whether it's in ag or whether it's in tourism um, or whether it's in the construction industry, uh, depending on what the strengths of regions are. And of course, we need to do this in a way that it's scalable nationally and it provides for the whole supply and demand of the future material requirements, not just in the construction and the, the, the infrastructure sector, but in the other ones that I mentioned early in mobility, housing and transport. We need to mainstream the idea of industrial symbiosis and in the interest of time, I won't go too much in that. I do have a panel after the break, so you're welcome to join that and we will unpack that further. And so I just want to implore the people in the room who are the decision makers that have the opportunity to make different decisions tomorrow. If we did have a European Union type waste directive, if we did have these eco design principles, uh, ERP mandatory schemes, what would that look like in your local communities? If we did have a national network that brokered the relationship, facilitating the supply and the demand of the materials, what would that look like for your local infrastructure plans? And if we did start acting like Team Australia, what could we achieve? So the maximum theoretical circularity rate, according to the CSIRO, achievable for Australia under today's economic structure is 32%. And we do know today's economic structure will need to shift in order to reduce the, the demand on extraction and virgin material usage. But if we just work on what we've got today, we still have a great opportunity. So beyond 2030, we will have huge shifts in material flows, we know that, and that will reshape business models and the way that regions and local communities operate. So what is everybody in this room going to be doing about it? Thank you.